Hello, everybody. This is Zaxter99. Once again, I want to talk about my favorite NFL team, the Dallas Cowboys. I also want to talk a little bit more about the upcoming mega game between the Cowboys and the Seattle Seahawks. It's probably going to be the game of the weekend, and a lot of people are going to be tuning in for this one on Fox. It's the late game on Sunday, and it's uh, one, about 1.25 p.m. local time in Seattle, a uh, Sunday afternoon game couple of things I want to go ahead and mention talking about this particular game. Done a little research here, and I think everybody knows the success that Dallas is having with their big offensive line doing so well this year, spending three of the last four years using their first draft pick and drafting the offensive lineman. Tyron Smith, four years ago, and then last year, 2013, they used their first round pick to draft Travis Frederick. And then this year, they draft Zach Martin. They also have Ron Leary, who's playing a very good game this year. And then they have Doug Free on the right side. Now, behind that big offensive line that's doing well this year, DeMarco Murray is having a very, very nice year so far after five games already rushing for 670 yards uh, through those five games. He's on pace right now to hit 2,144 yards. And if he does, if, you know, he holds up, this would break an NFL record set way back in 1984 by Eric Dickerson. So as you can see, that's a 30-year-old record. Murray as well already has five straight 100-yard games, even in the first game where they lost to the 49ers. He had over 100 yards running. Now, this weekend against Seattle, he, if he was to get another 100-yard game, okay, he would tie Jim Brown for being the only one in history to ever get six 100-yard games in a row. <clears throat> and that would tie Jim Brown. That's a record set way back in 1958. So we're talking about a 56-year-old record here in the NFL. And Murray can tie it this weekend if he has a 100-yard game rushing against Seattle. If he does it two more games, he'll break that 56-year-old record. Okay? So Murray, do not underestimate what the Cowboys offensive line is doing this year and the running of DeMarco Murray. This is substantial. Also, when the Cowboys lost uh, Sean Lee, their middle linebacker, for the season, that was a crushing blow to them. But they picked up Rolando McClain. Now, he was drafted number eight overall in the first round in 2010 by the Raiders and didn't live up to his hype, his high, high pick hype. Last year, he went to the Ravens and technically retired uh, after the Ravens didn't even use him. This offseason, Dallas acquired him for simply a six-round pick to replace Sean Lee, who's torn his ACL and is out for the season, as I mentioned. McLean already through five games, has been marvelous for the Cowboys' defense. 19 tackles, he's had a sack, and he's had an INT. And he's becoming kind of a leader there in Dallas. So, I don't think anybody expected Rolando McLean to come in and have the impact for the Cowboys' defense that he's had. So here's, the, here's some stats to throw at you as well. Obviously, the Cowboys' success this year has been the offensive line giving Romo a little more time. He just had that off-season back surgery last December. Okay. And running the ball behind DeMarco Murray has put Dallas in a lot of third and two, third and one type situations, you know, or avoiding third down altogether because they get a first down on first and second down behind the running of DeMarco Murray. Makes the game a lot more manageable for Tony Romo, who's not having to toss the ball up 40, 50, 60 times a game. He's doing it for more, with more around 30 times a game on average this year. And that's helping the Cowboys. It opens up the receiver action, opens up Des Bryant, opens up Terrence Williams. And Dallas has already thrown a lot of touchdown passes to both those receivers, Des Bryant and Williams. Romo has also been really good at finding Witten over the middle for a lot of key third down conversions. Cole Beasley is playing a big impact as well. A little slot receiver, real small guy, but he has all the heart in the world and will go up and get that uh, 
get those passes, and he's converted a lot of third downs as well, even though he's not used near as much as Witten, Des Bryant, and Williams. So <clears throat> I've already predicted in a previous video I did last night that this Dallas defense, the hustle and the surprise of the Dallas defense, they're going to give up some yards. We already know that. They're going to give up some yards to uh, to Russell Wilson, okay? And they're also going to give up yards to Marshawn Lynch, who's a big back. But I think the hustle and the heart of the Dow Cowboys defense is going to keep the Dallas defense. They're going to bend, but they're not going to break against Seattle. They're going to give up some points. But if Dallas controls the ball again and has another 100-plus yard day, and gives DeMarco Burry the ball 25 times or more, I see the Cowboys controlling the game, controlling the score, and I see the Cowboys pulling out a victory. I'm guessing 27 to 23, somewhere in there, will be the final score. Could be a little bit more high scoring than that, but if I had to predict it, if Dallas doesn't want this game to be a, a 45 to 41 game, if they're scoring that much, that means we're almost probably throwing the ball too much, and the Cowboys aren't controlling the clock like I think they should, or like they should. So if it's a lower score, 27-23, like I'm predicting, that means Dallas is playing the game right. They're keeping the uh, offense, they're keeping Russell Wilson and the uh, explosive Seahawk offense off the field, and they're they're managing the clock. So if Dallas has success with the balance behind DeMarco Murray, their offensive line again, then I predict Dallas with a victory this, this weekend. If Dallas wins, it's going to surprise a lot of people, and this is the next topic I want to talk about, guys. Dallas wins against Seattle this weekend, even if it's only a three or four point win. This is going to shock a lot of people. A lot of people are going to be watching this game, and it's going to turn a lot of heads. Now, before this season started, Dallas was pretty much a joke. The diehard Cowboy fans that have been following the Cowboys ever since, you know, their whole life or whatever, like myself, uh, I started watching football way back uh, in the late 70s. I started watching football when I was only six years old. And love the Cowboys then because my dad and my grandpa loved the Cowboys. I mean, we lived down in Texas at the time, and it was natural to be a Cowboy fan. I remember growing up with, you know, Tony Dorsett and Danny White. Ron Springs is a backup running back. I remember Drew Pearson and, and Tony Hill. Uh, so I remember all these guys. I remember the defensive side, Randy White and Two Tall Jones and, and all those guys on defense that made Dallas so great back in the early 80s. Dallas went downhill towards the end of Tom Landry, uh, who had coached the Cowboys for a great number of years. Tex Schramm was the owner back then. And then what happened is after Tom Landry went, three, I think, 3-13 three in 1988, uh, back in the late 80s, in the 89, Jerry Jones came and bought the team. I remember also reading articles or rumors that that a Japanese owner, someone in Japan wanted to buy the Cowboys as well, but Tech Schramm refused to sell the team to a Jap Japanese owner and refused to have Japan owning an American football team. I remember being kind of, uh, I, I appreciated that from Tech Schramm not selling the team to, to somebody in Japan. A cor I think he was a corporate guy, you know, obviously just trying to make money in some business owner in Japan or whatever. Uh, that would, would have been kind of weird. But they ended up selling the team to Jerry Jones, an Arkansas businessman. And, you know, it made sense at the time. I didn't really like the way that that uh, Jerry Jones came in and, and fired Tom Landry the way he did. He didn't do it with a lot of tact and respect. And I think Tom Landry deserved more respect. But I still remember all this really well. I remember how excited I got in 1989 in the draft when Dallas used their number one pick because they were the worst, uh, with Tom Landry, they had the worst record. They used their number one pick to draft Troy Aikman out of UCLA. I was so pumped up to see Aikman come in and uh, take over for the Cowboys. I mean, I was like, wow, maybe we're finally going to get good. The Cowboys next year behind Aikman and nobody, no other supporting cast. I believe that was also... Right when Dallas, um, Jimmy Johnson, who had been picked as a coach from Jerry Jones, Jimmy Johnson came in, and Dallas only had one good player on that team before they picked Aikman, and that was uh, Herschel Walker. 
<laughs> as a running back was their only was like the only good player. And I remember being teased in high school about the Cowboys only having one good player on their team, and that was Herschel Walker, who was highly overrated, by the way. Didn't play with a lot of heart, especially when he was with Dallas. Uh, but Dallas traded Herschel Walker, and I remember this specifically. Dallas traded Herschel Walker away to Minnesota in what is now known as a trade and got all the players and like three years of draft picks, high draft picks for one player. An insane trade that Dallas made and that Minnesota gave up to get Herschel Walker. Herschel Walker didn't pan out in Minnesota, but Dallas sure benefited from all those high draft picks that Minnesota gave to Dallas, plus the players Dallas got from it. One of the players Dallas got, I believe, was Emmett Smith. I mean, that might have been their own pick. I don't know. But anyway, Dallas got Emmett Smith the very next year. And, and towards the middle of the first round, Dallas had Aikman. I mean, had Aikman, and they also had Irvin from the 1988 draft when uh, Tom Landry was still there. He had drafted Irvin. Irvin was coming along now, and then Aikman now. And then they started getting some offensive linemen. They went 1-15 behind Aikman their first season. And then... Uh, in 1991, Dallas went 7-9, and nine, I believe. And the only reason they could have made the playoffs that year, if the Saints had lost one of their last two games or if they had won one of their last two games. Well, that was when Aikman had a shoulder separation surgery early in his career. He couldn't play the last two games. Babe Laufenberg, like one of the worst quarterbacks of all time, uh, came in for the Cowboys. Uh, I remember my dad as a kid. I remember my dad watched him pass and just shrugging, going. My dad called him Dave Loft a bird, loft a bird, because he would throw the ball up so high that defenders would find it easy to get to the ball by the time it got to the receiver, either make an interception or make a play on the ball. But he did throw the ball way too high a lot of times, and my dad called him Dave Loftbird. It was pretty funny. So Dallas lost horribly the last two games. The Saints ended up winning a big surprise over the 49ers. They handed the 49ers only their second loss of the season uh, in week 15 of the 1991, so Dallas did not make the playoffs. It's probably a good thing they didn't because they probably would have got slaughtered. Uh, Aikman was, you know, had that separated soldier, so he wasn't going to play anyway. <clears throat> now, the story I want to tell you guys here is being a Cowboy fan is sometime either during that 7-9 season or after the 7-9 season, I could see a little hope for the Cowboys. I was excited about the Cowboys, and we lived in a real small town here in Idaho town. It was a population of like 250. We had no stores there or anything like that. And I actually had to drive 45 miles to go to a mall, to go to a, a sports store, you know, where that sold all the jerseys and footballs and stuff like that. I wanted to buy my dad and myself because we were both big Cowboys fans. And it was the first time we saw any glimmer of light for the Cowboys, especially after the trade and after getting Emmett Smith and, and Troy Aikman. And I really wanted to start showing, you know, our pride in our Cowboys, especially since we saw that glimmer of hope. Drove 45 miles to the sports store, and this is a true story. I walk in the sports store. I'm looking for Cowboys jersey. I don't see anything. I mean, I had it in mind that I was going to buy Aikman jersey, I think, or Aikman shirts. But I couldn't find anything. There was nothing Cowboys in the whole store. And I remember going to the clerk there in that store. And this is in Twin Falls, Idaho, by the way. I asked the clerk, I was like, did you have any Cowboys jerseys? The guy basically laughed at me. He was like, Cowboys? He's like, why would we put Cowboy stuff on the shelf? It won't sell. He's like, we're not in Texas. You're in Idaho. The Cowboys suck, buddy. I believe he said something real close to that about the Cowboys sucking. Why would we put it on the shelves? We'd never sell it. So I drove home disappointed that I wasn't able to get it. I believe I... Uh, I believe I ordered online. Obviously, we didn't have the internet back then in that year, 1991 or anything like that. But I believe I ended up subscribing through a Sports Illustrated magazine or something like that to a Dallas Cowboys weekly newspaper. And then in that Dallas Cowboys weekly newspaper that came every week, I, you know, I saw ads to order jerseys and stuff like that from down in Texas. And I believe I ordered jerseys. Uh, I ordered them through the mail uh, from some place in that Dallas Cowboys weekly. And I ended up getting my Aikman t-shirts for my dad and myself back then by ordering them. Anyway, Dallas that next season went 11-5 and five and basically started showing a lot of people that they were the real deal and a lot of people could start seeing the building of a dynasty here. Even though 
They didn't do too well in the playoffs. They got beat in the second round, I believe, that year, 38-6 to by Detroit, I want to say. Um, they were getting blown out in a lot of games as well. I remember another game during that 1992 season where the Eagles beat them on a Sunday or Monday night, 24 to nothing. Eagles were definitely one of the big nemesis of Dallas back then. The Eagles were a good team. Defense was t- was horrible. They were they were um, cheap 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 uh, a lot of cheap hits, a lot of low hits, a lot of really crushing blows. I mean, trying to take players out, trying to take Emmitt Smith, trying to take Troy Aikman. I mean, trying to hurt them, not just trying to take them down. I mean, absolutely trying their best to hurt them and maim them. And that's one of the reasons I hated the Eagles back then. But Dallas went 11 and five, and after that season. Even though they lost in the second round of the playoffs, a lot of people started seeing the Cowboys might be a formidable force, especially the next year. And especially after they had all the draft picks, I think they still had like two or three first-round draft picks coming as well from the Minnesota trade and stuff. So I drove back to the same store, 45 miles, to that same sports store. And this is a true story. One year later, I walked in there and, again, saw no Cowboy shirts, no Cowboy jerseys to buy. Again, I asked, it was a different clerk this time, but I asked him, I was like, hey, do you guys have any Cowboy shirts? You know, the Cowboys are doing pretty decent now. They were 11-5. and five. And this was the statement I got from the person that worked there. Dude, we cannot keep them in stock. We're ordering them as fast as we can. We, we just got so many X amount in, 40 of them or whatever in earlier the week. They're all gone already. They could not stock them fast enough to keep them on the shelves. And that was a one-year difference. Between 91 and 92... A store basically went from laughing in my face about why would we carry them because they would never sell one year later to go and they couldn't keep them stocked fast enough. I'll never forget that story. It's a true story up here in Twin Falls, Idaho, the sports store that was down there. I don't remember the name of the sports store, but it was Sports Authority or whatever it was back in the time, back in the early 90s uh, that I had went to. And a one-year difference in the Cowboys' performance went from evidently people never wanting to buy a jersey when they went in there they couldn't keep them stocked because they were selling so fast. Now, Idaho is a long ways away from Texas, so you're not going to see a lot of, you know, lifetime fans of the Cowboys, especially in the early 90s, up in Idaho. But once they start doing well, once TV starts carrying them, a lot of fans in Idaho were starting to say stuff like, oh, I've been a Cowboys fan all my life. Oh, yeah, I've been a Cowboys fan ever since I was a kid. And I guarantee you that's my next point, guys. If Dallas, this is a critical game this weekend, if Dallas pulls out a win against Seattle, it's going to turn a lot of heads. And I guarantee you, if Dallas does win next week and the week after, you're going to start hearing and seeing a lot of people wear Cowboys jerseys that you were like, wait a minute, I thought you were a Seahawks fan. Wait a minute, I thought you were a 49ers fan. And they'll be like, oh, no, my true fan has always been the Cowboys. You know, I just, they'll have some excuse or or whatever. They'll say the 49ers and the Seahawks are their second favorite team or something. But I guarantee you, this is going to be a big game Sunday. Dallas might get blown out. If they do, you're not going to see it. But if Dallas pulls out even a three-point win against Seattle, it's going to turn heads. And you're going to start seeing people at work, school, wherever it is, whereabouts. You're going to start seeing more Cowboys jerseys being worn. You're going to start seeing more Cowboys ball caps being worn. And you're going to start seeing a lot lot more people say they've been a Cowboys fan all their life. Which brings me to my next question, my next topic. Bandwagoners. I guarantee you five, six years ago, seven years ago, when Seattle Seahawks sucked, there wasn't hardly any Seahawks fans around Boise. Now, I live in Boise now, not too far away from Seattle. Um, there's not a uh, NFL team here in Idaho. So there's a lot of either Denver Bronco fans or Seattle Seahawks fans. But never has there been more Seattle Seahawks fans around here than since the Seahawks won the Super Bowl and did so well last year. Since they got Russell Wilson, you know, that kind of thing. But I find it amusing that that every year, whoever the best team is, (laughs) there's so many more fans for that team that are showing up. And almost none of them will tell you, oh, yeah, once the Cowboys started getting good, I started liking them. Most of them won't tell you that. They'll tell you, oh, yeah, you know, I've been a Seahawks fan all my time, all my life. I've been a 49ers fan all my life. I've been a Giants a few years ago. It was the Giants, right? When the Giants won the Super Bowl. Oh, I've been a Giants fan all my life. You heard that a lot just a few years ago. Now, 
now you're seeing a lot of Denver Broncos fans since they got Panning, Peyton Manning. Yeah, they've been a Broncos fan all their life. They've been a Seahawks fan all their life. And this weekend, the Cowboys beat Seattle. You're going to start seeing more lifetime Cowboys fans showing up. Um, you know, you can always test them. You can ask them questions that they, if, if they don't, you know, to ask them a question when they don't have anything available to research it, ask them who was the quarterback with Tony Dorsett, ask them who the receivers were back then, you know, see if they can give you Drew Pearson and Tony Hill, see if they can also name the receiver Butch Johnson who played back then as well, you know, give them little quizzes like that and see if they're really a lifelong, uh, Cowboys fan. Now, someone may not be as old as me and may not have been around during that era. But still, you know, I, I, I do find it amusing that we have so many bandwagoner fans, and they won't even be honest. You know, they're, every year they're a fan of whatever team's the best, and that's, their fa- that's been their team forever. You know, just admit it, guys. If you're a bandwagoner, go ahead and put it down in the comments below. <laughs> Let me know you're a bandwagoner. Tell me who you like now. Tell me if you're starting to notice teams like the Cowboys with their offensive line. Or if you still think they're they're a joke, um, whatever. Even if you're not a bandwagoner, you know, leave a comment for me. Let me know what you think of the Cowboys this year. Are they the real deal? Are they going to beat Seattle? Now, obviously, don't come on after the Seattle game if Dallas loses and say, "Yeah, I knew the Seahawks." Tell me before the game. Don't tell me after that you knew that was going to happen. No, tell me now. Tell me before this game. What do you think is going to happen this weekend? Again, I've already told you I think the Cowboys are going to pull this one out. I could be dead wrong, but I think that the Cowboys limit their mistakes and limit their turnovers. Uh, I see the Cowboys winning this one in a big upset. I wanted to tell you guys that, though, about my past with the Cowboys. You know, what actually happened, because I do think it's a pretty interesting story, especially about that store and couldn't, you know, they would never put a Cowboy shirt on the, jer- on the shelves because it would never sell. The very next year, they couldn't keep them in stock. Um... And I'm sure that happened across America, you know, at sports stores all over during that same time. And I'm sure this has happened not only with the Cowboys, but with other teams as well. So maybe you have a story like that as well uh, for any team. If you do, go ahead and put that uh, down in the comments below. Let me know what happened and what you witnessed uh, as far as, uh, you know, the uh, fans and the bandwagoning is concerned. Also, let me know what you think of the Cowboys. Are they the real deal? What do you think they're going to do this year? Do you think they're going to make the playoffs? Um, are they going to end up going 8-8 eight and eight a year? Are they going to fall? And, you know, what happens if Romo gets hurt? What happens if DeMarco Murray gets hurt? Will the Cowboys uh, start losing games and start looking like themselves last year? What do you think is going to happen? Be sure you put all those comments down below. Let me know what you guys think. Please give me a thumbs up or thumbs down. Let me know how you think of this video. Rate the video if you would, please. It helps me out a lot. You know, if you guys enjoy the content, the talk that I'm actually giving you, or if it bores you. Also, be sure you subscribe to me if you haven't already subscribed so you can get all my future videos. I do everything from video gaming to cooking to how to raise my bearded dragon and pets to, you know, all kinds of stuff. How to fix things, uh, football, sports. I'm going to start talking about boxing here as well. Uh, do everything from all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, you never know what kind of video I'm going to put up next. So I definitely try to keep it interesting. I want to thank you guys for watching again. This has been Zaxter99 and my talk about growing up as a Cowboys fan. Um, And the... I I can talk... There's a lot of stories about growing up as a Cowboys fan, but this is one of the... uh, one of the things, one of the really good memories that I have that I think would be interesting to to some people out there who might listen to the the whole story. Anyway, thanks so much, guys, for watching. This has been Zach Serena 9. You guys have a good day or night, depending on what time it is when you're watching this video in your neck of the woods. Take care, everybody.